Hey everybody, welcome back to Matrix Mash. I have no idea what number this is. It's like eight or nine or something like that. Anyway, it's been a few weeks and my good buddy Robert Phoenix and I are back to uh, hit you over the head one more time with a dose of surreality. And uh, Robert Phoenix, you're in Oakland, how you doing? Or not in Oakland, you're in Northern California, sorry. I'm at an undisclosed location <laughs> in Northern California right now. I'm undercover, I'm wearing, I'm wearing like an undercover hat and everything. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing great, Emily. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on again, or thanks for being together again. Yes, we do this together. Thing. It's our we thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. I'm I'm great. I had a a little vacation, and now it's been kind of a little bit to get back to work and all that kind of stuff. But um, I'm raring to go, and you know the simulation just doesn't quit. It's always spitting out shit for us to talk about. So here we are to pontificate about it and leave our two cents behind, and and that's what we're gonna do. So. Uh, what you got for me this morning? Well, the ticker tape of sur surreality is clearly, as you say, spitting it out. And um, there's a lot of really interesting things going on with Julian Assange mm -hmm. currently. And one of the things that I brought up about uh, about three weeks ago, just before, it was actually just after they arrested him, and it was a week before Easter, was that Assange was fitting this model of the cyber Christ. Mm -hmm. and how um, he was being, for all intents and purposes, crucified, right? Did we talk about that, about him being the god of transparency? I think you and I talked about that. Did Maybe. I talk about you about that, that I, or did I talk about it with Randy? I can't remember. You might have talked about it with Randy. Okay. Uh, but, but he fits a lot of these sort of bullet points of, you know, being persecuted, uh, you know, uh, be, being uh, jailed uh, for truth. There's almost kind of a a sainthood uh, yeah. uh, that, that's kind of evolved around Assange. Yes. Uh, and even some strange stuff like, you know, about his father. Like, you know, he's got like really weird kind of, you know, prehistory with his father, his stepfather. Well, he grew up, he, he grew up in the family cult in Australia. He did, he did. He grew up in that family cult uh, with Amanda Burns Hamilton, right? Is that her name? I think so. uh, yeah, anyway, uh, she, the, crazy absolutely crazy for people that aren't aware of it uh the family was essentially kind of a doomsday cult with ties most likely uh to the cia and australian intelligence and what they were doing is they were getting kids who were uh being either given up for adoption or they were in foster homes or they would come there vis-a-vis -vis like julian assange uh, through a broken marriage, and, you know, yeah. and so this woman, Anne Anne Hamilton Byrne, uh, that's her name, and so she 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 was basically creating kind of like this version of like you know, little Uber mensches, super kids, and of course the way that they go about doing it is the way that you know, you know the techniques are things that you and I have talked about, yep. a, lot, a lot of psychic driving, LSD. Yep. Uh, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, all that stuff to try to crack these kids open mm -hmm. and see if they can turn them into sort of these geniuses with super mental powers and, and exert more control over them. And, and Julian Assange was part of that, part of that group. And all the kids had, had their hair cut really short. Yeah, and Julian Assange, and it clearly worked. I mean, whether you like Julian Assange or hate Julian Assange, she is an absolute genius with what one can do with the internet. There's a lot of really interesting ties with Julian and, yeah. and intelligence groups as well. Yeah. So now a member of the family actually reached out to me a long time ago. Like I did a big piece on Julian Assange. I remember. Back, I think it was around 2009 or 2010. Yeah. And, and I really dove in and I, like I was, I don't, I don't mean to sound like, hey, I, you know, I got to that mountain first, but. Robert, I, you often get to the mountain first. Well, I got there, and wear, I really wear that, wear, that, uh, wear that title well. So, so what was interesting is that a member of the family actually sent me an email. Mm -hmm. And she even, I, I wish I still had that email. She even referenced Julian by a different name. Like he had a different name there. Yep. And she said that he was not subjected to the same kinds of how do we say this ritual abuse that the other kids were? Yeah, now, I, can't, I can't confirm that or not, but he was still there. Right. But this is what, so, uh, 
two things I want to think about. I did a show probably about a year or more ago with Sophia Smallstorm about Julian Assange. That's kind of had some interesting stuff. But also one of the things that uh, I know for sure from my experience, and it comes up over and over again for me as I work through things, that they often pick certain children to not necessarily be tortured, but to watch the other children be tortured. And that, that and in some ways that can be, um, that provides a more powerful tool for mind control. Yeah. Because that child who's witnessing the torture of other children will do whatever is wanted of them in order to make it stop because it is awful to watch other children or animals be tortured. Right. So if there's some, you know, gift or power or talent or whatever that a child who is witnessing torture has and they want the kid to do it and the kid is normally resistant to do it or has trouble tapping into it or access it unless they're in, in fear or panic mode, watching other children be tortured would be a way to trigger it. Right, so that makes makes total sense. So that's that that's his background, at least at a very very early age, and um, you know, fast forward, he's in that embassy for God, what was it, seven years almost, like an incredibly long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so they pull him out, and the images of Assange as he's being moved out of there are very Christ-like, like he's doing this, he's. You know, signs and signifiers. He has his book. He was holding a book that that wrote very close to him. You know, right. some about press freedom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he's also that book uh, was uh, Julian. There was a book Julian by Gore Vidal, which I got into very yes. intensely. And uh, he had a lo long hair and a beard, which is a new yeah, look he, for him. Yeah, he looked like a mad prophet in the desert, right? I mean, what? that was that was his his vibe. So, and this is all happening right before Easter. The timing is really significant around this. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, Mike Pence had brokered a deal with Venezuela right around the same time. And Venezuela is going to get like $50 billion in IMF money. Yep. And that really Ecuador, kind of... Ecuador got, got some IMF money, too. Which, uh, they get the, uh, the new... Oh, it was Ecuador. It was Ecuador. My bad. Thank you. Ecuador. Ecuador. Yeah, yeah. It was Ecuador, not Venezuela. It was Ecuador. Yeah. And Ecuador got the money. And that's, that's like the modern version of 40 pieces of silver. Yep. So Ecuador hands him over. Uh, now we have Trump, who loved Julian Assange, loved WikiLeaks because of the the back channel. I remember him saying, I love WikiLeaks. That's right. Then he denies him. Mm -hmm. He denies him and, and says, I don't know who he is, you know, which is typical Trump in a lot of ways. Yep. But, but he plays the role of Peter the denier, right? Yep. So, so this is a really interesting, all these parallels are starting to add up. Now, in the last week, we have Pam Anderson mm -hmm. visiting Julian Assange. Yep. And she's been a kind of a fairly frequent visitor to the Ecuadorian embassy. It looks like shit, by the way. Yeah, she's, you know, Pam Pam has been, I think, ro road hard, right? Yep. And, and uh, you know. Beautiful, yeah. She's had, she's had a very kind of, I think, I, you know, one can make a case she might be an MK, you know, beta kitten, uh, quite possible. She's an interesting character, and I'm going to share a story in a minute, that, but I want you to finish what you're saying. She's an interesting character, and she's far more intelligent than her um, the role she's played in Hollywood would, would lead one to believe she is. Right. She's almost coming off like a modern day Marilyn Monroe, right? Who was a lot more intelligent. Right. And she's had, you know, some interesting marriage partners, shall we say, right? Tommy Lee, yep. Kid Rock. And yep. there's a rumor now that she's actually got gotten married to Julian Assange. Right. So that's the room. Now, now if you look at Pam Anderson, she is kind of this, this version, this modern day version of Mary Magdalene, the harlot, right? right. The harlot who then turns to Julian Assange, who is the cyber Christ, and mm -hmm. regains her virtue. Mm -hmm. Now, she's had an explant, which means her boobies aren't as big anymore. Mm -hmm. So she's trying to revert to some kind of virginal state, right? Like, like the pre-op pre Pam Anderson. Right. So this is all starting to line up now. Okay. She's now the new Mary Magdalene. And, and Trump just pardoned this guy, what's his name? Benin? Behenna. Behenna. Yeah. Who, who was this guy who was a shooter and, and killed an Iraqi, right? Yeah. So Behenna becomes this modern version of Barabbas. Yeah. Who is pardoned 
essentially taken off the cross before the crucifixion of Jesus. So all this is lining up with Assange. It's really interesting. So, so the question is now, is this part of this modern retelling of this tale? And is the, is the omniverse assembling these people in a way that is reflecting this deep mythos? Or is this part of a program? I think it might be a little of both. I'm leaning towards oh, the program. I can't wait to tell you what I got to tell you, Robert. <laughs> all right, well, all right, jump on in. Jump on in. So, uh, pa Pamela Anderson is interesting for a variety of reasons, and I've seen her around my whole life because she lives here in Southern California, and you know, uh, she, you know, was with Tommy Lee and whatever, and she had she had children in gymnastics, and. Um, so this reformation path for her has been going on for much longer than people think. Um, she, something that people don't know about her, probably, it was a little teeny bit in the media at the time that it happened, but not a lot, was that there is a gymnast named um, Mohini Bahardwaj. She was on the US national team for many, many years in the 90s and into the 2000s. And she was one of these gymnasts that was very talented, but you know, was a smart ass, right? And, and didn't always, you know, train in the way that was most effective for her to reach her maximum potential. And then as happens with many, many people, and this is starting to become, you know, such a pattern that I'm looking at it from many angles. She took a scholarship to UCLA and went there and had a complete, you know, come to come to Jesus kind of thing where she realized, you know, she loved gymnastics and her potential. And at, at one point had, I think almost been kicked off the team, but then got her shit together and was very successful and went on. So she went through the whole Miss Val experience at UCLA that I will talk about probably a separate episode about something else with you that I'd like to do at some point, but people have heard me talk about this on off planet radio. And she, um, after college decided she wanted to go back to competing elite and began training again. And, you know, was, was, you know, having to support herself and do all this kind of stuff. And she was training for the Olympics. And Pamela Anderson was, her kids were training at a gym that Mohini was training at after college. And she stepped in and basically supported Mohini's training so that she could just did not have to work and dedicate herself fully to accomplishing her Olympic dream. Mohini did make the Olympic team at, I think, 24 years old, which at that time, this was, I think this was the 2008 Olympics. If I'm, I can't remember if she was on the 2004 team or the 2008, 2014. She was the 2004 team. Uh, she, she, a couple things happened. She made the team. She went there. She qualified to an individual event final on the floor exercise. But most importantly, because I, if you're really trying to understand how the simulation works and all this kind of stuff, she did a, a skill that had never been done by completed successfully by anybody else in their national competition. Called, and it's now named after her in the code of points called the hard wash. It's a challenging skill. It's a unique skill. Um, and so her comeback was successful and Pamela Anderson was a huge part of that. So, you know, she has this natural want to help people. And then she has this other sort of programmed image that we think of her as the Hollywood person, the Baywatch or whatever. So she's perfect for this role that you're talking about as Mary Magdalene. Here's the interesting part. So you sent me an email saying you wanted to talk about this last night. I didn't get it till this morning because uh, I went to sleep early. So I read that. And then my dad calls me into the room and says, I have something to show you. And those of us in the gymnastics world had been waiting to see, anxiously to see who would be appointed the new head coach at UCLA because Ms. Val retired after 29 years. And this morning, Chris Waller, it came out that Chris Waller was appointed head coach. Chris Waller has been the associate head coach for a number of years, and he also was the coach who continued coaching Mogini Bahardwaj after she was done at UCLA and took her to the Olympics. The only person to comment this morning in the news on Chris Waller's hiring, there, there was a quote from Mr. Ali who commented, but in this article, the quote came from Mohini Bahardwaj. Well, what does, this is, and I remember this from like an interview I saw with her year, probably 20 years ago. Her name, Mohini, means illusion, right? And it, it, I just find it all, how is it that you sent me that? I saw it this morning about the thing with Pam Anderson. I, I already decided I was going to tell you about the thing with the gymnastics. Then two minutes after I decided that, my dad calls me in and tells me the thing about Chris Waller. And, and nobody, Mohini Bahardwaj has not been talked about in years, right? All this going on this morning as we're getting ready to do this. There's something else interesting about Mohini Bahardwaj that can lend and go into something that we may talk about next or later in the show, and that she's Indian. She's, she's, she's part Indian and part Russian. Wow. 
Okay, and so that goes into Russian collusion, which Julian Assange is accused of. And one of the other things I want to talk about with you is Tulsi Gabbard, who also is Hindu. Well, Hini Bahardwaj is Hindu. Right, 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 right. right. That's what her name means, illusion in Hindu. Uh -huh. Right? Interesting. So, I mean, yeah. we live in a simulation, Robert. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we do. And I think there is another level and layer to the simulation that wants to interpenetrate the simulation. That's the thing. I think there's the control level and then there is this deeply spiritual level. And That's I right. think of Mohini Bahardwaj, certainly Miss Val, and in a lot of ways, Pamela Anderson is it has a, having levels to them that are deeply spiritual. And even even somebody like Julian Assange, who at times I've considered, is he even a real person? Is he a bot? Is he a clone? Is he an MK? I think he's, pop, 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 you know, I think that like everything is much more layered and complex than anyone would like us to think it is. There's so many realities, inter, you know, sort of interwoven together. And, and it's like, you know, it's hard when you're a person at the center of some of that stuff to figure out which one is you. Yeah, I would agree with that. And even with the advent of AI and more and more AI technology coming online, it's going to get more and more difficult mm -hmm. to sort of sort through uh, the Maya, you know, sort of the techno Maya. What my, and Maya is another word for illusion. Exactly, exactly. And we have the Mohini and the, Maha, and the Maya. Like this morning, I posted this article on, on Facebook. It was about how Microsoft is coming up with a new version of microsoft word mm -hmm. that actually will correct it's your called. language if it's politically incorrect oh wow yeah it, it, you know that's interesting and speaking of political correctness this was another point i wanted to tack on to that i'm you know like i know people sometimes don't understand why i associate so many things to the tennis or the gymnastics or whatever but one of the things i want to talk to you about in a separate show is this gymnastics becoming extremely politicized and this sexual abuse case as being the catalyst for people to start paying attention to it but gymnastics is becoming an sjw sport right yeah and it's almost like um uh, these all these young female gymnasts are gonna be you know they're like biblical characters like maybe they're like the jews right the israel you know or something something that got you know uh moved from their homeland and abused but now later they're gonna come and they're gonna be the boss of everything kind of like you know or whatever right yeah. <laughs> like they're starting, I mean, it's becoming an SJW sport and it used to be super conservative, but this weaving of political correctness into everything, even to things that at their advent, no one would have ever dreamed that would have anything to do with that gymnastics, Microsoft, whatever, right? Like everything now has that ability to have that thread woven into it. Yeah. There's an Australian um, rules football player who is, I think the, I think he's like the equivalent of LeBron James for Australian rules football. I mean, the guy is really, really good. Yeah. And um, I believe he's either Samoan or Tongan. Anyway, um, he had a couple of tweets where he was quoting the Bible. Yeah. And he was quoting the Bible in reference to homosexuality. Mm-hmm. He got, he basically got suspended mm -hmm. from his team. He got suspended from the Australian national team yeah. as they're getting ready to head into international competition. Right. Um, he may not play professional rugby slash rules football again. Yeah. Now think about that for a moment. Think about if LeBron James did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And basically, the NBA was saying, you're never going to play basketball again. Yeah. It's this, it, it has the same level of equivalence. Yeah. And, and apparently, the guy who is the CEO of the, of the team that he plays, or there's, I, have to, I have to kind of untang, uh, unlock a little bit. There's a really important figure in Australian rules football who is gay. Mm -hmm. And he's basically putting his thumb down on this player yeah and what's interesting is that the christian community is sort of galvanizing their support or, because he was not he did not apologize for his tweet yeah he didn't right. for all intents and purposes i mean he was he was quoting the bible 
right? Yeah. I mean, he was just quoting something. And we, we well, live that's, that's where everything is going now. It's going to the Bible is racist or homophobic. The Constitution is racist or homophobic. Well, this, Law yes, this brings us back to Assange. Yeah. And, and the crucifixion of Assange. Yeah. Because they're trying on some level to basically put an end to Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's let's be clear about that. They want they want Christianity out of the picture, um, and you know, uh, they 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 essentially want everything associated with Christianity, which is mostly Northern European, Western, and white. They want it out of the picture, yeah, because they want to create an entirely new system. Yeah, okay? and Julian Assange is couldn't look any more you know Northern European, Western, or white than Julian. Right. Absolutely. So, so you know, we go back into Notre Dame, the fire of Notre Dame. Julian Assange is borderline. Uh, what do they call it when someone's uh, the super white? The um, Aryan. No, the uh, pigmentation disorder. Oh uh, well, there's albino. albino. He's practically white. He's he's. I'm really white. He's even more white than me. Yeah, you're. I mean, you're you're a bronze god compared to him. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm melanated compared to Julian Assange. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this is going on right now. And, and part of this is this destruction of the last 2000 years mm -hmm. because they want to insert a new program. Yeah. And the new program has nothing to do with, with Christianity. It may have something to do with the syncretic amalgamation of the Abrahamic faiths where they have this new religion that they've kludged together, uh, which is quite possible because they want to put a like, they want to they want to have like a dome or you know they want they want to do something kind of uh, you know syncretic with Notre Dame. They want to have like a little bit of Islam, a little bit of Christianity, right? That's their new version. You, you, I know we've talked about him before, but you know that guy Zachary Hubbard who does all the gematria of everything. Yeah. He was convinced from what he figured out through Gematria that ultimately the religion that they're going to usher in is Baha'i. That's what I said. I've been saying that for years now. Really? Absolutely. I've, I've heard you say everything. I've never heard you say that. I've been, I've been talking about Baha'i for a long time. You know why? Because they're the Baha'i World Headquarters is in Israel. Ah, uh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, Baha'i is the is is the blending of basically the Abrahamic faiths, all under one rubric. So it's basically, I totally, I totally agree, by the way. I've been talking about Baha'i for... It's a religious Hegelian dialectic. It's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Right, and Baha'i will be the, the new world faith. I Man, I've talked about Baha'i. It's interesting that he came up with that. Yeah, I haven't um, looked at him in a couple of years. Just yeah. He became repetitive at a certain point, and you know, he's kind of a difficult personality, although I think he's very smart and right about a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, when he said that to me, it resonated for me in a certain way because there was this, when I was in elementary school, there was this little girl that used to ride the bus with me. Like she was probably, when I was in fifth or sixth grade, she was probably in first or second, but she was Baha'i and she used to sometimes sit next to me and talk to me. And that always stuck out in my mind. Like I've always, it's the only person I've ever known that I knew for sure was a Baha'i. Right. And, um, you know, so I think she was only there to direct my awareness to that. The, the, those guys, Seals and Crofts, were behind. She lived, she, she lived on a street called Mini, because I went to private school, so they dropped us off right at our house, you know? Yeah. She lived on a street, her name, this is so funny. Oh, you're going to laugh. You know what her name was, Robert? Serena. Serena. Oh, that's funny. Her name was Serena, and she lived on a street called Mini Haha. Mini Haha. I love that. <laughs> Serena from Minnehaha. Who's Baha'i, yeah. Baha <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree, agree with that. Now, one of the things that's going on as well is that there's we've had these shootings at these Lubavitch temples, yeah. right? So we had one in Pittsburgh. Um, we had one in San Diego, uh, um, Poway. And then Parkland School. Mm-hmm. Is oh, very, Chabad stuff. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, very much connected to that Chabad Center mm -hmm. in Florida. In fact, Scott Israel was a very prominent figure, and is still a prominent figure at that that at that Bahad, Chabad Center. Of course, his last name is Israel. That is right, the exactly. simulation. We have Anthony yeah. Wheeler. We have Scott Israel. Right. <laughs> so, so we have we have the highest ranking Chabad member in the country 
basically at Trump's right right elbow all the mm -hmm. time in Jared Kushner. Right. Jared Kushner is deeply involved in Chabad. Mm -hmm. And, and um, astrologically, you know, Trump has Pluto in, in Leah, which I've talked about before. And he's got Pluto in the 12th house, which is a very intense placement for Pluto. Jared, uh, Jared Kushner's true note, which is the ascending plane of the moon, is at Leo. It sits right on Trump's Pluto. So what we have here basically is a vampiric situation. Like Jared Kushner is literally sucking the life force out of Donald Trump. And he's really becoming the president more and more with each passing day. Now, the reason why I'm bringing the Chabad up because of these events that are taking place is that they have a very interesting and twisted kind of version of their, the, the, the universe and life on Earth. Yeah. And, it's, and essentially, in, in the Chabad world, that the Earth is completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. Completely destroyed. And they're the ones that remain because they're pure, pure mind and pure body and pure spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And after the destruction of the world, they're the ones that will rule over the planet. Mm -hmm. And so what they've been waiting for is this, this figure called the, the Mosiach or the Messiah. Uh -huh. And Jared, Jared Kushner is starting to kind of cohere yeah, it's to, that, to, to that pattern, right? Mm -hmm. So now we've got this competing kind of version of like the end, end times or the end game, which is the Chabad version. Right. Okay, what I'm, what I'm, okay. Finish your thought, and then I'm having a thought that I'm just going to try. So, and so the whole idea would be to theoretically, you know, nuke the entire planet, which I don't think they really want to do, because obviously it's kind of a cool planet, and they'd like to, you know, have some to rule over. But, but this is kind of this this version. Maybe the nuclear thing is kind of a metaphor. But the other interesting thing that I noticed was that all three of those places, Pittsburgh, Poway, and Parkland all begin with P. Yep. And P is, I believe, the 17th letter in... So it goes back again to Gematria, which is a big thing in Kabbalah, which is a big thing with Jewish... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Okay, so listen to this thought that just went through my head as you're saying this. Okay. Okay, so remember all that stuff that was about, like, the Trump time travel Tesla stuff that was yeah. out? Yeah. So have you been paying attention? And I only know very little about it, right? But to all this stuff people are talking about, about like Tartaria and mud floods and resets and Tesla and free energy technology and stuff yep. like that. Yeah, yeah. So I think those things are related to this destruction of the earth and like what seemed to happen is that like all these children were left after these mud floods that would be taken to new areas and become, you know, you know, new, new reality was set up and, you know, time was reset and history is reset and all that kind of stuff. And, the, when the Notre Dame fire happened, it started me thinking of that because when you look into any of these research people have done on Tartaria and mud flood, they're always showing these dorm, church dormers and free technology on church churches and things like that. And when I saw that rosette window on the Notre Dame thing, my body started thinking that that's what it will, you know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. So because of that Trump Tesla time travel theory, right, where Trump's uncle had something to do with the stolen Tesla technology, uh, could they be ushering in a, a mud flood for a reset? With I think the reset's coming regardless. I think I think what they want to do is they want to manipulate their way out of being part of the reset, which is what theoretically has happened, right? Like Jay Whitener has a theory that, that the Archons got off the planet the last time the reset happened. And what they did is they went to, they went to Mars. Right. And when they returned, they were they were all oxid oxidated. They were all redheaded, red, you know, red 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 skin, you know, freckles, redhead, red beard, and that's when this kind of redheaded mythology begins to assert itself. Right. The planet, and it actually makes some sense, and, and you know, because if you if you look at Mars, there are very interesting references to Noah and Mars. Uh -huh. Like there's an actual there's an actual like period of Martian development that has Noah's name attached to it. Well, hasn't Elon Musk also said that in order for people to go to Mars, they would have to become cyborgs? Uh, maybe. Have you heard? I think there's that too, which is making me think that like maybe being a cyborg would prevent them from becoming oxidized. Yeah. 
So let's do this. Let's take a quick break and okay. and put put the uh, put the video on pause. I'm gonna pause it. And let's do let's let's take this up in the second part. All right, pause. Hey guys, we're back. Sorry, Robert was having a technical difficulty. His battery was dying. My battery never dies. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We should just plug into you. You're the, you're, you're the energizer bunny. Or something. So yeah, so I think I think what they're trying to do, I think they're trying to, I think they're trying to maneuver so that they can get out of the reset. Mm -hmm. And and I think the initial idea was to occupy these dumbs. Yeah. And yeah. I think and I think a lot of those dumbs have been blown up. That's what I've heard. Yep. That when people hear these major kinds of you know rumbles or things that sound like explosions. Yeah, that's because these facilities have been detonated. Well, and I think a lot of these facilities have been detonated by the minions that were hired to build them and then found out that they weren't actually going to be included in the rescue plans. Uh, that's a really interesting, uh, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, it, it sounds about right. So yeah. now I think they're scrambling now to try to figure out how they're going to deal with the reset. And I think the reset is connected to the solar minimum. Mm hmm. And that, you know, we're going to go through a period here where it's going to get fairly cold. Yeah. And it's going to, and, and, and if you're not right around the 34th parallel or lower, I think it could get pretty dicey. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's my sense. So they're trying, they're trying to manipulate the reset somehow so they can get out of it. Well, I think they're trying a couple of things. And I think one, I think, one of the things they're trying is to see if they can create uh, through frequency, through 5G, through vibration stuff, through dumping heavy metals, through filling us up with that kind of stuff, like a vibratory situation where, right, like they're like, so if, you, if your body is vibrating at a certain frequency, you're going to be able to escape something that's happening while those vibrating at a different frequency will become victim to it. Right. Look at any of the... Uh, Fringe, look at, so I, Fringe is relevant to everything. So there's the episode of Fringe where Peter's from the other universe. And so when there's a certain frequency happening, the person sitting next to him on the bridge who's from this universe just basically disappears, like incinerates, just gets evaporated. And Peter blows an eardrum, but other than that, it's fine. Right. Right. So I think like that could be part of what's being set up here. Yeah, I think this comes back to Assange again. What are the other things I've been thinking about, in addition to like Baha'i as being the new world faith and, um, and the competing model with the Chabad sort of post-apocalyptic endgame, is the creation of like a, a real um, simulation, mm -hmm. a real simulation, right, where, where the new Christ really is kind of inserted into this, you know, cy cyber genetic or cybernetic world. Uh -huh. And that, and that Sophia is the new the, the new AI, you know, goddess, right? So I think that that's another kind of model that they may be, you know, theoretically working on. Like a new age metaphysical simulation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that everybody kind of dropped into it for however long until the reset is over. Yeah. And then that model ends and then they come back into 3D and run everything again. I mean, I, I think that there are a number of, realities that were that are that are in competition with one another yeah right yeah um, but you know as that's happening we're being kind of put through the ringer on this level yeah you know we just had another shooting uh two days ago right monday and i said you i sent you the link to that one right the, the daily shooter do you remember like do you know who patrick henningston was is yeah the 21st century wire he used to have a piece he did called the daily shooter yeah <laughs> Well, it's getting, it's getting to be absurd. So the latest one took place in uh, Colorado, mm -hmm. not far from Aurora, right? Ah. Not, not far from Columbine. So yeah. uh, the kid who, who, who supposedly did the shooting, what kind of li in a weird way, he kind of lines up like John Ernest. Mm -hmm. John Ernest was the shooter in, in Poway. Same kind of profile, except on the left, mm -hmm. right? He's a musician. He plays guitar. Ernest played piano. Both kids were theoretically described as good kids. 
people are very surprised that it happened. But he's very unlike Ernest in that he hates Christians. He hates Trump. Um, and the, the second person who was involved in the shooting was a, tra a, a guy transitioning to a girl, mm. transgender. Yeah. So that finally came out. So now that, blo that blows up the media and their narrative around, you know, who's doing these shootings, you know, that they're, that they're white, they're angry. Right. They're, they're Aryans. Well it's Whatever. interesting it's interesting that both of these people were musicians because i would say that someone being a musician might make them particularly susceptible to sound mind, mind control through sound yeah through octave you know through octave you know sort of harmonic geometry octave sort of sonar control something like that mm -hmm. um you know sound being used as you know like i mean sound can be used for healing or sound can be used for a whole bunch of, of, of nasty stuff and somebody who's very uh, astute at picking up small tones and sounds and music, right? You could very easily trigger them with something. Yeah, I mean, sure, absolutely. They may have some tune that they really like and not understand that that's being used to program them. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's really funny. This is totally unrelated, but I was listening to, uh, well, it's kind of related. I was listening to XM Radio a couple days ago in Marky Ramon. Mm -hmm. has a two-hour show on XM Radio. Of course, he's the only living member of the Ramones. Mm -hmm. All the rest are dead. So he, he, the Ramones did a record with Phil Spector called End of the Century. Mm -hmm. and that was back in 1980. And some of the tunes on there are okay. Some of them are like, they're kind of really, really weird. It's like Phil Spector, girl group sound meets the Ramones. Right. But anyway, Marky, Marky Rubone was talking about Phil Spector and how he's a good friend. Right. And Phil Spector, of course, is in prison. Yeah. You know, for, for killing his girlfriend. Right. Yep. And I just I'm bringing it up because Phil Spector was somebody who was deeply involved in sound. Deeply. Yeah. In fact, he created a term called the wall of sound. Yep. Which was just kind of overwhelming um, layered. Kind of almost symbolic soundtrack. When the uh, underground raves first started coming up and stuff like that, there's a lot of parties in the Midwest that featured, quote unquote, a wall of sound. Right. So that is a feature of environments that you're trying to create mind control in, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, there's also amazing things about it. And this is like, this is what people have got to get their, really wrap their heads around is that your greatest mind control happens in the thing that is also something that can be very freeing and a wonderful thing for you. And so there's no, and it doesn't mean we should avoid it. It means we have to be really, really aware and watch our states of mind after we've had an ecstatic experience with something, you know, right. um, but, and also these things can be used for healing. I mean, the very same tools that, that we are all now using as part of our healing and wellness were things that were used in mind control in the seventies and eighties. Right. And so it's very like, you know, and, 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 and there's so many people in the alternative space that wants to say, say, this is amazing or this is terrible. And it's, it, it's much more nuanced than that. And sound I, I, is totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, we have to be really, really smart and, and have a lot of well, discernment about yep. how we interact with materials because yeah, you're going to get some things that are really amazing and kind of, you know, liberating or freeing or, or, or they're helping you break your system. And at the same time, a lot of those techniques are being used in these kinds of parallel ways. Every, every, every what it is all depends on how you integrate it and how you, you know, clean your, you know, clean your mind after an ex exhilarating experience and, and how you, you know, it's very important to have time away from technology and to, really give yourself a time. If you've done some of these, you know, healing modalities or sound spiritual modalities or whatever, really give yourself a time to integrate that before you're on to the next one and on to the next one and on to the next one and really look and see, you know, what things that you've taken from it are valuable and what things are just keeping your machine running. Right. Right. Because when your machine is just starting to run and things, that's when things sort of sneak in. It's, I mean, it, we live in such a complex, and this is kind of goes to everything we're talking about today, that there is no simple answer about anything we're talking about. There are no more 
this is a good person, this is a bad person. At least not on the public, you know, the wide public stage. Everything is extremely nuanced. And if you're, you know, if you think that you understand what you're looking at just from a cursory amount of paying attention to it in the media or research, you are wrong. These are deeply complex characters, deeply complex technologies and situations and events that, you know, and they are, a lot of these events are, because they look different, we don't think about them as being like events in the Bible that are, you know, like monumental and ritualistic, but some of these actually are. Right. <laughs> it sounds almost stupid to say that, but if you look at all of the complexities and all of the planning and years and things that have gone into some of these and the development of the characters that play roles in these things, like these are, these are events that are designed or synchronized to create ripples that last throughout time. We yes, that. totally agree. Totally agree. Um, one of the one of the uh, people that you brought up before we get on the air, I think, really typifies this, and that's Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, that's and, and uh, you you mentioned that Tulsi Gabbard was endorsed by Joe Rogan and Ron Paul, and Tulsi really kind of you know fits in that libertarian kind of space. Well, she fits both in the libertarian and in the green space. That's right. Yeah. Now, because very anti-war. And I really like I like her. I do too. I like her. She's one of the few people that's actually gone to Syria mm -hmm. and actually tried to figure out what the hell is going on there. Mm -hmm. um, she has a great deal of common sense. Mm -hmm. You know, she served in the military. She's yes. she's Hindi, right? Yep. Now, sounds great on the surface. Mm -hmm. but then she's you dig a, a little bit she's deeper. A she's a surfer, which you know, there's a lot of metaphors to be able to deal with life involved in surfing and whatnot. Um, she's military. She's, yeah, she's she's beautiful. She's, she's got. She's, she's got. Yep, yeah, she's got five planets in Aries. So oh, she's an ass kicker, right? Five planets yeah. in Aries, and she's a member on the Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's one of those things. If you want to get elected, unless, of course, you're Donald Trump, who really kind of fits that outsider mold in some ways. If you want to get elected, you got to play ball. Yeah. Right? And so she's she's on the team. So, again, you know, she looks on paper like somebody who's interesting and has her head on their shoulders, right, and could actually maybe do some interesting things with the country and the world, and maybe it's her time. But on the other hand, she's a member of the club. I mean, I mean, I think this speaks to the levels of complexity that you're talking about. She is, I mean, so this is, these are my thoughts on her. I mean, obviously, I am long uh, anarchist, voluntarist. I don't believe in voting. I don't believe in government. I also don't write letters to Santa Claus, um, you know, and I have no intention of going back. But when, you, when I observe, like, I, I, even, I, I commented on something like this on a video yesterday, like, I understand not everybody is at that space where I'm at, right? That some people still need to believe in this system. They still need there to be government. And so there's a, a, a lot of things going on here. To me, somebody, particularly a person on the left, saying that they are going to vote for Tulsi Gabbard or, endorse, or endorsing Tulsi Gabbard is a sign of sanity, right? Like if you can't, if you look at all of the candidates, she is clearly the one that has so far shown the least amount of corruption, right? Who has shows the best level head, the best sense of morality, the best sense of walking your talk, hits on the things like, you know, like she's not just your, you know, privileged white male, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? You know, she is even like the one thing that's come up about her that's been a little bit controversial is in the past, because she comes from a very religious background, her father is extremely conservative. She has had made remarks that led people to believe that she was anti-gay. She's apologized for those and said in a very eloquent way that that isn't what she believes anymore. That was a product of her upbringing. It was when she was much younger. So she's, you know, made a mistake and redeemed herself, you know, all that kind of, she like, it's a sign of sanity that anybody who still believes in voting wants to vote for her. So that's one level of it. But then when you look at the more, the deeper down layer, she was in the military, right? She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and she's also from Hawaii. And we have been through one other mind controlled president who was from Hawaii and seemed like he was gonna be a breath of fresh air. Now she's a little bit different because she was not, she has not been endorsed by Oprah, right? I think the system would really love to have 
a Joe Biden or a, uh, a Buttigieg, right? Or a Klobuchar or whatever, whoever the fuck these people are. Um, or even a Trump, right? You know, like, because Trump is a, is a figure of the system as well. People, I thought in the last, in the last election that people wanting to vote for him was also a sign of sanity, not because I think he's a good person, I don't, but because he was rejecting all of this shit that we had been in, indoctrinated into with political correctness and whatever. So the sign, it was a sign that people were starting to recognize there was something wrong with status quo. So she's the new sign of a level of sanity. So I think she's there because if they can get away with pulling off another person like totally but they reach a tech monopoly rejection of all these regime change wars this thing with julian assange is going on she's supported him she's you know spoken out against all these things she's like okay if we can't quite pull that one off we have her to turn to and usher in at the last minute and she may not provide us the level of control that we want the massive level of control but she keeps people engaged in the system and gives us hope to regain complete control over it i think that's the rule i think that you know again i think she's probably a very good well-intended person and i think that the the they have this they have this down to a science as to have to weave into somebody their own plans and purposes i see her very much like how i'm you know i'll talk about this in something else we do with miss val at ucla and the gymnastics kind of thing right these are good people who are doing good work and have helped a lot of people but there is something about the kind of archetypal character that they are that allows the control system to weave in the thread that they need weaved to continue sewing their blanket. So oh, absolutely. It's like, well, what part of the narrative can they pick up on and who can represent that part of the narrative? And she also would be like, you know, a bridge to Baha'i. Definitely a bridge to Baha'i. Mm -hmm. Big time bridge to Baha'i, for sure. Um, yeah, I, 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 could, I could easily see that because it's like, you know, what, what are these people really at a high level? I mean, they're, 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 they're really just like, you know, they're, they're sheep herders. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. They're sheep herders. And, and if they can find somebody. She can, catch, can, she can catch the lefties that are about to, you know, all these people, there's a few renegade reporters on the left who didn't fall for the Russiagate, right? So the people right. who follow Jimmy Dore and Matt Taibbi and Aaron Maté and Michael Tracy, right? They yeah. like right now they're on the free range and they're looking hard to find a plantation to, fit, fit, to get those people back onto. And That's Tony right. Gabbard might be that plantation. That's right. Absolutely. So it's all about managing yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, you ever watch that, that show, uh, Deadliest Catch? You ever see that show? I, love, I haven't watched it in years because I'm too busy, but I, I used to be able to watch like 20 of those in a row. I love that. It's a kind of an amazing show. Anyway, yeah. one of my new favorite words comes out of that show. Yeah. It's called, they call the crabs the biomass. The biomass, the yeah. The biomass. And yeah. that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the biomass. Yeah. And it's about, you know, them being on board that ship and just managing the biomass to where they want to take it. Yeah. And they knew that there was going to be this awakening post Obama. Mm -hmm. that really not many people could stomach Hillary. Right. And that Trump had been groomed for quite a while to ultimately play that role when he yeah. was called upon to play the role. And he's done it. And he's still doing it. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's double dealing, you know, he's double dealing from, the bottom of the deck as well is uh, to this day and, and, and totally perfect because islam or or you know zionism or chabad style you know the orthodox judaism is going to feel too restrictive to people but talking about something like hindu or baha'i in between seems like okay that's a little bit more reasonable that's right that's yeah absolutely, absolutely right in fact like if you go to new age culture you mm -hmm. know in kind of the few remaining new age bookstores that are, that are still around, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of the overarching ideology is either going to be kind of like, you know, uh, seven Ray stuff, um, you know, St. Germain, you know, all that, all that yep. kind of high strange. And then the other would be coming out of the Hindu world. Yep. Right. So you're, those are, those are still two very kind of agreed upon cosmologies or belief yep. systems. Yeah. And um, I could easily see them, you know, merging like yeah. a merging of sort of new age with that sort of yeah. And that's been going on for a while, and um, 
bottom line is, is that, that people are, we're dealing with some, some very hardcore realities. Number one, we're dealing with the end of retail. That's happening. Totally. Right before our very eyes. Um, you know, shops are closing right and left. Chains are closing right and left. Automation is coming in. So you're going to have a groundswell of people who are going to be either out of work or earning less, or working three to four jobs in order to make ends meet. And they're looking around the political landscape and they're not happy. They're not going to be happy. Meanwhile, if you live in a state of like heightened control systems like California, you're going to get, you know, taxed to your, you know, to, to, to you get sick of it and want to leave. Right. So all that's going on right now. And they're going to need to find something to quell the masses. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, and I think that, that, that this idea of blending these belief systems, perhaps, you know, somebody like Tulsi Gabbard, the new candidate, you know, and they, they play this role as what's called known as the, uh, uh, the Judas goat. Right. And they just lead people into this new, yeah. new territory. Although I do think Tulsi Gabbard, she's got like four planets or five planets in Aries. Yeah. They're very hard to manage. I don't, I don't think it's, that's what I'm like saying. Some of these people are good people, right? I think actually part of what has happened with Julian Assange, right, yeah. is he uh, didn't turn out to be quite as controllable as they would like. I think see, we've talked about this also in uh, relation to Russell Brand. Right. right. So I think some of these people that they think are going to be, I don't, I don't know that she's going to be manageable. I think. A lot I don't of think people, she is. I don't think she's going to be very manageable at all. A lot of these people that they're hoping to manage or that are being managed right now are just one um, fact find one understanding of something away from being like, Whoa, wait a second. I'm not playing that role. You know? Um, and, and I think that it's important, you know, like that's why you and I are doing what we do. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, that that's, you know, like all it takes is, you know, a, a, like looking at the statue from a different corner of the room, you know what I mean? And suddenly what, what, what is happening appears clear. I don't think, she, I, I think that, I, I don't think, um, I don't think this is going to be able to be managed. So I think things are going to get really messy. And what you're talking about is like this merger of all these different realities that have different levels of some that seem to be a, a little under, more under control, others less under control, but none of them are actually under control. And it's just gonna, you know, so everything is just so messy and so sloppy and so chaotic. And, and I think this uh, desire people have to run away from the storm or to escape the chaos, bad move. I think sit still, sit still right there in the middle of the chaos because the chaos is going to leave that space. It's so wild, right? Like all these people are like, I got to get to South America before, you know, the shit hits the fan here. Nope. I got to get out of the city before the shit hits the fan here. Nope. Like, I think they're expecting people to do that. And that need to escape that desire to escape is their next management plan mm -hmm. yeah that still be buddha everything that we we've talked about today whether it's um you know assange is the cyber christ or the christ within or tulsi gabbard as sort of this new gatekeeper slash agent of change i mean all these things are, are within us Mm -hmm. right? They're all inside of us, and these characters will pop up yep. to, to remind us of that. Yep. Right? So, you know, everything that we need, all the technologies, the spiritual technologies that we need are all inside of us. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything that people can take away from our chat today, it's that, right? And what you and I do is we get in here and we, you know, get our hands dirty and we root around and try to find out kind of what's going on and have a few good laughs. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, people are far more well equipped than they can really understand. Mm -hmm. and, and if they can wean themselves off of levels of dependency, mm -hmm. um, while at the same time understanding that we're all connected mm -hmm. in a very interesting and unique way, I mean, I, that's really the way forward. Yeah. You know, learning to really listen to your intuition and your own inner knower. Your yeah. own inner knower really knows. Your own inner knower has been through all of this before and recognizes what's going on and is already leading you in the direction you need to go. You know what I mean? And so stop thinking about it so much. Stop looking for the answer outside of yourself. Go with the inner knower. Right. And, you know, have some fun and play and be creative and don't take it too, don't take it too seriously. Yeah. 
you, you know, because you take it too seriously, you get brittle and you'll just break. Yep. So you got to stay pliable. You got to stay loose throughout the yeah. whole thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, well, listen, Emily, this has been great. It always is. Yeah. It always is. All right, guys. Uh, if you want a reading, go get one from Robert. They're amazing. RobertPhoenix.com. If you would like an intuitive nutrition consultation, hit me up on Facebook at Emily Moyer, and we will see you guys next time. All right. Yay. All right, cool.